so as we wind towards conclusion here, let's go back to one of the early things that you said. You, were, you mentioned the, what you called the anthropology of everyday life. Can you, for those of us who have been locked in our homes for more than two months now, can you do a little bit of reporting back on the state of New Haven as you see it, as you ride from your office to home on your bicycle and some of the encounters you've had? You know, what, what are you seeing out there in the city in terms of the general welfare, the general's morale? We can tell always a kind of mixed bag of stories. I, I have this rental office in Fairhaven and I walk the, the, and bike around these streets at night as I'm sort of struggling through my own moral and human quandaries. And there's so many families on their porches and yelling back and forth to each other on other porches. And that sort of sense of kind of fragile twilight social public that was not there six months ago when I was doing the same kind of moral pandering. Um, my torments are persistent, but notably the social public and then sort of talking back and forth on the street. I experienced some of that in East Rock too, but in East Rock, I think there's a, there's a different kind of both a class and culture of quiet and sovereignty and independence. And so I want to link up to like who's doing what work, who has to do the essential work of the city, who has to get in their car and go to work. Those are largely brown and black bodies in the city. And, and they have a different relationship to the freedom of that this moment affords, where someone Dom, I was just talking to on the street the other day was saying, he's like, you know, it's kind of fun to walk these streets without everyone else around and feeling on the one hand kind of empowered that they occupy the economy in a more central way, on the other hand, bearing the deaths and the suffering greater. Um, so there's something that's sort of broken in the social cycle where the streets are less filled with the regular cars, the stores are less filled, but they are operating and moving and moving in ways that kind of indicate both how much we need, especially this particular institution of Yale, to be going on in order to keep open businesses, but also how much its loudness sometimes, not sometimes, always silences other kinds of communities and voices that are happening. I'm really interested too in the disparity of church obedience and sort of the racial disparity that white churches in New Haven have largely shut down and doing remote services. A lot of brown and black churches are still trying to find ways to function in person with social distancing. And finally, I think just notable that the sense of, uh, as Mayor has pointed out, just the, uh, the decline in crime, this, the sense that economic strife does often lead to criminal activity, but it's been notable that there's been a significant decline in New Haven. And to me, it's a striking, the stories that we tell about what brings out criminal activity are really quite false, as our colleagues, J.C. Mayor and uh, Elizabeth Hinton would tell us. I just struck by an interesting piece when one of the major engines of capital is quieter and isn't transferring as many bodies. At the same time, you know, there's this large scale engine of the hospitals, which hit its peak of patients in uh, the second week of April, but has functioned with, frankly, a great deal of care and dignity in this and has been a signal model for other hospitals across the country in managing this health crisis. And of course, that's filled with New Haven workers and Yale doctors and Yale doctoral students doing their degrees. The history I would love to read some is someone who writes the anthropology from janitorial staff up to uh, the dean, how that hospital has operated and understood itself as a social community since it seems to me they have most led forward in thinking ethically about how to care for all in this crisis.